So today we're going to uh, present Lecture 12, which is on the action potential, one of the most important stories in physiology. Uh, so we'll do that, unfortunately, right before the exam. But the Unit 2 exam, as you all know, is next Tuesday, and I'll give my typical comments at the end of the lecture today on what to know for the exam. Uh, and uh, we're going to have eye clicker questions for beginning again today, so if you want to get your eye clickers out, these are good questions for getting ready for the exam, too, to see how you're doing. So, is everybody kind of turned on, so to speak? Okay, first question. All the following proteins are affiliated with the thin filaments of skeletal muscle excites. Okay, I've got 45 seconds clock on here now, so it should stop. Ten seconds left. Everybody make sure you get logged in. Five seconds. You don't have many people here, I guess. Okay. <laughs> And you chose D, Titan, which is true. Titan, of course, holds the thick filament in position. It's really not part of either filament. So the other four proteins are all affiliated with a thin filament. Okay, second question. Which of the following pharmacologic agents would cause the most rapid depolarization of the resting membrane? And just a side note, if the term ionophore means that essentially you're increasing conductance, that ion that that ionophore is uh, effective for is automatically has a really, really high conductance. So the term ionophore opens up holes that are specific for a given ion. Because 
Uh, the resting iron potential is usually just slightly less polar than potassium due to contributions from chloride and from sodium. And finally, E nephedipine, uh, calcium channel blocker, uh, if anything, that would decrease potential. Some membranes are uh, depolarized by opening up uh, calcium channels, uh, and we'll talk about those later, but that would not depolarize the membrane at all, so by far the best answer is C. Okay. Head's projecting the thick filament had the opportunity to interact with how many thin filaments? It's kind of an architectural question or histology question. So it'll cut the uh, diffusion potential in half. So the correct answer is B. Greg got that. One. Darn. Okay, so that's uh, four. I got I got one at the end of the lecture that's kind of fun too. So I'll save that one for the end. See, 
integrated with everything else you know. So we'll stop there and then I'll re resume the eye clicker at the end. Okay, here's the Z down here. So if you increase that from 1, which normally is to 2, it'll make this minus 60 times the log. So it'll be, or it'll make it from minus 60 to minus 30. So it'll be half the amplitude. Okay. Okay, today we're going to talk then about um, um, action potentials, both their, where they come from and how they're conducted. And this material is from the first part of chapter 7 and also the last part. The part in between here, between 195 and 206, is mostly on architecture of channels. You can read it, it's cool stuff and what drugs affect what channel and so forth, but we'll be picking it up at various times in the class. Okay. When we're talking about action potentials, we're talking about a momentary stereotype change in the resting membrane potential. Uh, some people call it a nerve impulse, but it's a, a, a stereotyped rapid change in the resting membrane potential, and it only occurs in excitable cells. What does excitable cell mean? Well, not all cells can have action potentials. Nerve cells do, muscle cells, some uh, interesting gland cells, such as the adrenal medulla and the posterior pituitary, have cells that are depolarized in response to nerve impulses. So it has to be some some cell that has the ability to uh, produce this reversive change in the membrane potential. And there's a reason why, because they have characteristic set of voltage gated channels. What an action potential is, it's a very rapid event, it's stereotyped, and that term just means it's the same every time it occurs. Stereotype, it's a it's a repeatable event, and it ends up reversing the membrane potential. Here are some examples of, of uh, action potentials. This is one that's uh, seen often in a motor neuron. The resting potential is minus 70, and it goes up to plus 30, so it has an amplitude of 100 millivolts and a duration of, uh, of two milliseconds. Very rapid event. Here's so that's a nerveless action potential. Often muscle action potentials, whether they be cardiac or skeletal, start out in minus 90 and go to plus 30. So they're 120 millivolt amplitude. Uh, the duration of skeletal muscle is 5 milliseconds, and the action potential in cardiac muscle is very prolonged duration of maybe 200 milliseconds. So there's a lot of differences in their appearance, and there's reasons for each difference. But the story is that in all cases, you start out with a resting membrane potential and you go reverse it, go up to a positive potential. So it's a reversal of the membrane potential. It's the same in any one tissue every time it's generated. And even 200 milliseconds, that's a fifth of a second. All of them are fairly rapid events, although neuron and skeletal muscle action potentials are much long, shorter than cardiac action. They're conducted non-decrementally, very fancy very fancy word. Actually, I put propagated on decrementally, which is a better term. Propagation, you know, from biology is reproduction. Birds propagate more birds and so forth. In other words, it's reproducing rather than conducting. And as you'll see at the end of the lecture, that's what we do with an action potential. We reproduce it over and over again. It's not really conducted like electricity is conducted down the wire. It's reproduced over and over again. So we say pro propagate it. And secondly, uh, non-decrementally, a decrement is a, a decrease in amplitude. Non-decrementally means from one neuron that could be up in the brain all the way to the toe, the amplitude of a neuronal action potential is going to always be 100 millivolts. So you can have the same amplitude all the way down the length of the neuron, which is not like electricity. When you go through a wire, you and go through resistance and you lose amplitude. This is a very unique signal that does not decrement. Uh, action potentials are the basis of how our nervous system communicates with cells. It's the basis for um, some types of endocrine secretion, not all, but a large amount of secretion is mediated and controlled by the nervous system. And it is the basis for uh, easy coupling, what we just talked about, and unfortunately out of sequence a little bit, when we're talking about how we control muscles, 
I just skipped over the fact that you have to start out with natural retentions, because now we're trying to get to get to the first part of, of exciting muscles. So the excitation part of EC coupling we'll talk about today. Before you understand action potentials, you have to learn one other type. So you know, hopefully, pretty well now what we mean by arresting potential. Now we're going to first define something called a local potential before we get into a, a action potential. A local potential is a change in the membrane potential, usually induced by some sort of stimulus. It can be a hyperpolarizing or a hypopolarizing event. So let's say this right here is minus 60. Unfortunately, it's up here at the top of the abscissa. But let's say this is the resting voltage of a cell, minus 60. If you artificially, by injecting a current, uh, cause that potentially to be more polarized, we call it a hyperpolarizing current, or essentially injecting negative charge into the cell. And the depolarizing current would do the opposite. So if you inject a current the opposite direction, you can depolarize the cell. So there are potentials that do, and events that do both in cells. And a local potential is a term which we use to describe such an event in current injection. So just a momentary change that you induce by a, a stimulus, we call it a local potential. And it's usually, it can be done by current injection. It can be done by all kinds of other things. A very significant part of the story of local potentials is they're graded, which means they have different amplitudes depending on how much current you inject. It's pretty easy. So we also call local potentials graded potentials. So if you just inject a small amount of current, you'll slightly hyperpolarize more current. You get more and more hyperpolarization. So this amplitude of this local potential is proportional to the stimulus strength. And the same here with a depolarizing current. If you inject the current in the opposite polarity, you'll depolarize the resting membrane potential, and the amount of depolarization is proportional to the current injected. So we call that graded. It's not all or none phenomena. The reason we call it a local potential is it's not conducted uh, without decrement, if you will. It's only found in the locality. So this is just a very simple figure to make that point. So let's have a little stimulating electrode here. And then these are all recording electrodes. Let's see the event recorded down the nerve or axon, if you will. So right here, we induce a hyperpolarizing current. Go from minus 60 to, say, minus 80. If you measure it at 0.1, it might have the minus 80, pretty close to minus 80 amplitude. If you go a little further down, centimeter or so down the nerve, it might be a minus 40 and then a minus 20. If you go far enough, you won't even see it. So that's why this injected current is called local. It doesn't uh, go very far. It, it's the resistance of the nerve decreases its amplitude, just like electricity does. So these are all qualities of what we call local or graded potentials. And now we're going to talk about the other kind, which is an action potential. And active potentials are definitely not the same as local potentials. Uh, they first occur because a threshold is reached in a excitable membrane. So here, these are lo local or graded potentials in green here. So if you inject a little current, you get a little change in the poten resting potential, but then it'll go back to zero. A little bit more current injected. And these are depolarizing currents. You'll have a decrease in the resting membrane potential. But finally, if you reach a certain threshold, often it's around minus 50 millivolts, it'll all of a sudden cause a cascade of events that activate what we call an action potential. And so what we put here is a super threshold stimulation elicits an identical or stereotyped response, which consists of a rapid depolarization. It overshoots zero, so we call it a reversal. And then it goes down below the resting membrane potential, which we call hyperpolarization. So stereotype reversal of the membrane <coughs> voltage. Number two, the amplitude's independent of the stimulus strength. In the case of active potentials, once you achieve threshold, super threshold simulation will have no change in the 
character, either the shape or the amplitude of the response. So the amplitude, and for that matter, the slopes are independent of the stimulus strip. So we call it an all or none response. And number three, it's conducted non-decrementally. So if you stimulate that same figure that we used before with enough depolarizing current to reach threshold and measure down the neuron, you still get the same amplitude all the way down. You notice in this nice figure, what they've done is they showed you the uh, sub-threshold local stimulation represented here and then it reaches threshold and kicks off the action potential and as you go down the nerve you lose that local response uh, as part of the uh, pattern or the figure recorded and you get down here far enough and all you see is an action potential that's being conducted so anyway it's conducted without loss of amplitude which is non-decremental of course the most important thing as far as we're concerned because it has many clinical uh, corollaries and importances is what is the molecular mechanism that causes this stereotype change and so that's what we're going to talk about if you really understood the last lecture with the Goldman Hospital Cats equation you can really easily understand what's going to go on here but the resting memory potential let's say is about minus 60 millivolts in a nerve and it's because of all the phen phenomena which we talked about last time. It's essentially a potassium diffusion potential, but there's a little bit of contributions with other ions, hence the uh, GHK equation. And then right here, what happens is you start simulating or lowering that resting potential by artificial means or by some means. Uh, and once you reach a certain threshold, you start a series of basic changes of conductances. And the action potential will essentially result of a change in conductance of sodium and potassium. Uh, the sodium conductance represented here by the yellow uh, line is rapidly increases and reaches a peak at uh, just about a half a millisecond after the stimulation and then Go, undergoes a change that we call inactivation. So there's a rapid activation and inactivation of the, of the sodium conductance. So the first thing that happens with threshold stimulation is a rapid increase in sodium conductance. And as you remember, sodium is way out of equilibrium. It has a very strong driving force both due to uh, potential gradients and the concentration gradients. So sodium would rush into that cell extremely rapidly and as sodium goes in, that causes depolarization and then reversal of potential. And instead of being just back to zero, sodium keeps rushing down its gradient until it's actually hyperpolarized. Uh, that is essentially what we mean by depolarization. When we're polarized minus zero, we go to zero and then even uh, reverse the potential. And then what happens right here at the peak is the sodium channel is inactivated and so there's a drastic fall in both uh, conductance and current. Uh, without conductance you can't have any current so uh, we crash down here and we have less and less sodium able to move until we get down to the resting level of conductance of sodium. Potassium on the other hand also starts increasing its conductance when you reach threshold but what happens is the gates that, the channels that conduct uh, potassium open much slower. So the rate of increase is much slower and the conductance for potassium doesn't reach maximum until sodium's already almost done with its high conductance period. In other words, uh, the peak of uh, potassium conductance follows what we call sodium inactivation, which occurs right at the peak. So, by the time we close the gates for sodium, we're now picking up the potassium conductance. And then what happens with the opening up potassium gates is now you can have potassium now moving down its potential gradient really fast. There's not so much difference in, in concentration, but there's a huge potential gradient. So potassium wants to be at about minus 70, minus 80. So it's going to rush uh, efflux out of the cell. And so you'll, you'll uh, 
try to start repolarizing the cell. So by increasing potassium conductance, the cell repolarizes, hence the black line returns to normal. So an increase in current of potassium causes repolarization of the nerve. This period of time after the action potential in which the uh, membrane potential is higher polar than it has higher polarity than it normally does is called the period of after after it's called either hyperpolarization or after potential. But that's because of the fact that sodium conductance is even greater than normal. So usually there's a period after each action potential where the the membrane is even more polarized than normal, and that's because of that. The potassium conductance is even higher than normal. The reason for these changes in conductance is because you're opening very specific channels to ions. And we haven't talked about these channels other than to define them in one of the first lectures. So uh, now we have a chance to talk about these channels a little bit more. I'm not as severe as Bernard, uh, Bohr and Bopek do, but we'll talk about them a little bit. So these are channels that specifically conduct, conduct because of their stereo shape, because of their shape and, and, and charge, they specifically conduct ion traffic in one ion or another. And some channels are voltage gated, which means they're closed or open depending on the gradient of charge. So if you go from a polarized cell to a little less polarized cell, they open. Some are ligand gated, which means that some chemical or even uh, some of them are electrolyte ligands, but some chemical couples to it a, a uh, binding site on these gates or on these channels and they open. And, and these ligands can be either extracellular or intracellular. And in both cases, when occupied, when the channel, uh, when the uh, binding sites for the ligands are occupied, the channel opens. And finally, interesting set of ion channels are mechanically gated, and most of those are stretch channels. Uh, for example, in smooth muscle, there are many uh, smooth muscle tissues that are, when they're stretched, uh, they depolarize because channels actually pull are pull open mechanically. So. We have all kinds of channels of each of these categories and we'll be mentioning throughout the class. Channels are ion specific and maybe voltage ligand or mechanically gated. It appears that most of the voltage gated channels are very similar molecularly. They're all composed of four similar multipass protein domains and this represents the four domains but each of the domains has uh, six transmembrane alpha helices. So there's six helices and then a, a large uh, outside domain loop and then six more and so forth. And then these are formed into a cyclic type of array. Uh, the uh, extracellular and intracellular loops seem to be the gating elements and seem to be the parts that move in response to changes in the tension of binding to a ligand. And in most cases, and I didn't have this in the notes, but you'll pick it up from various things. In most of these ion channels that are voltage gated, there's an inactivation and a activation gate. So, uh, as in the sodium case, uh, about plus, about minus 50 millivolts, the activation gate opens, and then when you get to plus 20 or plus 30, a second gate, and then the activation gate closes. So, You've got two gates that controlling access to the channel, one that opens it and one that closes it, and then they both have to reverse before it goes back to its native state. The uh, ion specificity is apparently due to mostly this fourth uh, uh, multipath protein, the, the uh, uh, alpha helice C that's here, but uh, definitely it's the uh, multi the uh, multipath proteins that determine how specific they are to a given ion. And this is just a, another diagram of the same idea. This is a potassium channel, but it definitely they specifically allow only one ion to go through and then they open and close depending on those different uh, modalities we've talked about. How we've learned most of what we know about opening and closing these channels is by use of uh, 
agents, agonists and antagonists that alter their their opening characteristics. Um, interestingly, many of these are toxic substances. Some marine snails have 20 or 30 different ways that they can kill us, and each of these works on a different type of molecular mechanism, usually the gates for these channels. So anyway, we've learned a heck of a lot from using these agents that alter these channels. Tetraethylammonium, or TEA, is a uh, drug, actually not a drug, a, a chemical that actually blocks holding gate <coughs> passing channels. So it's an antagonist for holding gate passing channels. And tetrodotoxin is an antagonist for that sodium channel that opens for, uh, we just talked about, for opens during action potentials. Um, TT, or tetrodotoxin is an extract from pufferfish, for those of you who are into sushi. So that's what the, the well-skilled, hopefully, sushi chef tries to make sure that it's not part of, well, maybe a little bit part of the sushi we eat, so you just get a little tingling of your tongue. But anyway, we extract pufferfish in order to get this toxin out. Uh, and this is a, kind of sh trying to show you what these do. So. Uh, this is uh, some of all the ionic current that occurs during an action potential. You have an initial inward flux due to sodium and then a following a later outward flux due to potassium. It's not ion specific, it's just showing you the total current when ions move through a membrane after an action potential. If you give TEA to a neuron before you simulate an action potential, you'll only have sodium current. So. TEA blocks the, the potassium channel. And, and this gives me an opportunity to bring up a point, and that is this potassium <coughs> channel is voltage gated, as I kind of indicated uh, when I was going through the step by step part of the action potential. It's not the regular potassium permeability that keeps resting membranes at their potential, their diffusion potential. It has to be opened and closed. So, this potassium channel is opened and that causes a rapid repolarization. If you don't open this channel, if you block it with TEA, that um, nerve is going to stay depolarized for a much longer period of time. So the opening closing the voltage gated potassium channel uh, really limits the duration of a given action potential. If you give TTX or tetrodotoxin, also, saxitoxin from uh, dinoflagellates the, that are in the ocean. Anyway, that blocks also sodium current, and you won't have any uh, depolarization, but you'll have an after potential without a, a depolarization. So you're going to open the potassium channel, but not the sodium channel. So anyway, from fooling with these toxins, we've learned how active potentials occur. They're very useful uh, tools. Uh, to very specifically alter nervous function. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of how, uh, uh, what active potentials are and uh, molecularly how they occur. Uh, you can learn a little bit more about action potentials by learning about a couple phenomena that uh, modulate them. And so I'd like to show you these. And these aren't way out things. These occur in pathologies and are important clinically. Um, and the first is called voltage inactivation. And so here's our, this would be a very polar muscle, for example, minus 90 millivolts. If we stimulate it, I made it very simple, I didn't draw the little uh, stimulation going up, but then we get an action potential rapid depolarization and then repolarization. Okay, what would happen if you depolarize the muscle, say from 90 uh, to minus 80 or something like that? So if you first depolarize the membrane, and there's lots of ways we can do this, but let's just right now say let's depolarize it, and then we stimulate it, what happens to the action potential that's produced? This reduces the amplitude of the action potential. Instead of going from minus 90 to plus 30 or 120 millivolts, we go from minus, let's say 80% for the sake of discussion to 20, so that's 100 millivolts. So we've decreased the amplitude and that's an, a very significant and important point, and uh, it's because it reduces the, the uh, driving force. That, uh, well, let me finish the story first. 
VBMBT is the, the slope of this curve here. It's the change in voltage per unit time. And so if this is very, very rapid, this slope is supposed to be slower. I don't think it's drawn too well. But it means the depolarization occurs slower with a less polar membrane. So there's both a decrease in amplitude and a decrease in rate of depolarization, which that represents as you decrease membrane and pressing membrane voltage. And further, if you do it again, you'll even see a lower amplitude in a DVMDT right here that's even less. Okay, the reason why this occurs is you're decreasing what we call driving force. And the driving force is what causes the sodium to rush in. Now remember, sodium's going in because there's a large concentration gradient and there's a large potential gradient. Well, you're decreasing the potential gradient. As you get closer and closer to the uh, Nernst potential for sodium, which is way up here, there's less potential causing sodium to rush in. So there's not as much drive for sodium to go in. So not as much will get in before it inactivates and then and it goes in slower. So these changes, both the DBMDT and the amplitude, are due to reduction in the sodium driving force. And so when an activation occurs right up here, you've not got as much sodium in, and so the amplitude doesn't go up as high. <coughs> if you go up high enough, in the, um, and, and it turns out above threshold, you won't get any amplitude potential. The membrane becomes inactive. And so you just see the little stimulus artifact, but there's no action potential. And that's, well, we call it the gates, the, the voltage-gated sodium channels are inactivated. Yet the, what really happens, actually, it turns out, is the, uh, op the, the activation gate opens and the uh, inactivation doesn't close and ends up, they just don't work anymore. And so anyway, you end up with a, we call it voltage inactivation, that membrane can't be stimulated anymore. Uh, this, actually, this whole idea plays a role in what we call uh, refractory period, and let me try and explain that, it's a very simple idea. Uh, this represents, this is classic uh, uh, action potential, this one's at minus 70, we have a period of depolarization, overshoot, and then repolarization, and after hyperpolarization, all those things we talked about. This is about a one and a half millisecond duration, about a 120 millivolt amplitude. Uh, immediately following an action potential, a second action potential cannot occur. So if you try and stimulate right here, anywhere between zero and one millisecond, the second action potential, there will be absolutely no response. So from this, I guess it's kind of a light red area right here, called the absolute refractory period, it's impossible to get the a second action potential. So we say that the that the uh, membrane is refractory, absolutely refractory. If you wait till this point after one millisecond right here, you can get an action potential, but it'll take a, a super threshold simulation to cause it. In other words, you're going to have to raise the voltage higher than you normally do to get an action potential. And so all the way from here, all the way through here, it's very hard to induce a sec second action potential. There's a couple reasons for that, but the primary reason is that as you come back down right up here at the peak, you've got all the sodium channels inactivated, and as you come back down and start recovering the, the sodium channels, you're going to have some of the channels that have their inactivation gates uh, closed, and some of them the inactivation gates have started to open again, and the activation gates have started to open, and so you can re or close, you've got to redo both of them, and then you can activate it again. So in this range right here, you're still resetting the, the channels, the closing and opening channels of the voltage-gated sodium channel. And then when you're down here in this period of after hyperpolarization, as you can easily see, you're going to have to have far more depolarizing current to get up to the, the point at which those channels will reopen. So all the way through this after potential period, you're obviously going to have to have more depolarizing voltage to reach the, the point at which the activation gates open. So anyway, this is called the relative refractory period, 
and this from here to here, and then the absolute refractive period right there. So what I put in here, the voltage gate sum channels are inactivated at the peak, and then these gates, both activation and inactivation, have to be reset. And it's a family of gates that not, don't reset all at the same time. It's a huge family of these channels, and they gradually reset until they're all back to their normal configuration. Accommodation is another phenomenon that really depends on the, the same kind of mechanisms that we talked about with voltage inactivation, but it's um, useful because it applies in a little bit different situations. If instead of jumping from one voltage to another uh, with the resting memory potential, if you slowly depolarize a a nerve to reach an action potential, you get an interesting thing. So here you give a quick depolarizing current, an A, and you get your normal action potential. Instead, you gradually give a depolarizing current up to a threshold. You'll get an action potential, but it'll be of a less amplitude and a decreased dVMDT. Essentially, what you've done is you've changed the resting membrane potential so that you decrease the, the driving force before you get to the threshold. If you give that depolarizing current even slower until you reach the threshold, then you even have a less amplitude and a more decreased DVMDT because you're starting with a lower driving force. So essentially what this is, it's like voltage inactivation, but it's just giving the stimulus at a very, very slow rate. And if you give it slow enough, as in E, you'll, be, you'll have all those gates inactivated and you won't be able to start the cascade that opens them enough to cause an action potential. So it's really like voltage inactivation, but it's caused by a different thing, and that is a slow depolarization to reach some threshold. If you understand one of those two phenomena, you can understand both of them. Uh, that, yeah, that's a good explanation of why it occurs. Okay. Uh, the last general subject that I want to talk about was uh, conduction, which is pretty significant, and that is why does an action potential uh, go down a whole neuron without decreasing an amplitude? And the reason is it's not really conducted, it's propagated. And here's a very simple figure that's trying to make that point. Right here, let's say we you just take a nerve and it's got a membrane around both sides of it and you, at one little point, inject a depolarizing current, so you reverse the polarity. So right at this point of an axon that, let's say, goes millimeters each way, we depolarize it by injecting a current. An action potential will occur there, and so the potential will reverse, and that's what this is trying to show. They didn't draw the action potential, but they showed the reversal of polarity. So that occurs right here. Well, when the polarity reverses, you're going to start some little currents on the surface, uh, of charges going from one to another because they're right next door to each other. So it causes these little cyclic currents in charge that occur. And what will happen is the next or adjacent segment will then depolarize. So, and some of these figures don't kind of make it ridiculously long, but then they'll show this next little segment depolarizing, and then you'll have an action potential here, and then you'll have the next little segment depolarize, and then you'll have another action potential as it reaches threshold. So you're not really conducting a, a uh, little signal by an increase or decrease in the charge at that moment. You're re-initiating another action potential. That's why they're non-decremental. So at each point along this nerve, you re-institute a new action potential and go through the whole opening and closing of gates and on and on. And so the amplitude doesn't decrease and it just can the propagate it up and down the nerve. Now this event would be fairly slow if it weren't for a really cool modification that we've developed. So it, because it would take over and over again a long period to re-activate uh, the next little segment. But what we've uh, evolved over many years is an interesting phenomenon where we take another type of cell, which we call a glial cell, a Schwann cell to be specific, and during development, these wrap around and around and around neurons. And so most peripheral neurons and some central neurons 
are what we call myelinated. And that's because we have a, I don't know why that shuts off and off, but that's because we have this membrane that wraps around and around and around. Myelin is a very critical component of, of cell membranes. It's one of the phospholipids in cell membranes. And so it's like wrapping as it shows there in the figure, many, many, many layers of cell membranes. So during development, the this, this cell keeps wrapping around, 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 around the neuron and essentially making many layers of its cell membrane around the nerve. And so here's a Schwann cell with its nucleus and then there's another one here and on and on. So peripheral neurons, most of them are myelinated with these cells wrapped around them all the way down the, the uh, whole length of the neuron. In between there, there's little gaps, and they're called nodes of Ron VA. So in between a given Schwann cell is a little space, which is actually quite physiologically important, called the uh, node of Ron VA after the guy that discovered it. So in myelinated nerves, what happens with conduction is there's an action potential right here, but the current, the local current, has to go clear down here to depolarize the next segment. So instead of doing a new action potential a millimeter down, you'll have to go the whole length of a uh, cell, of a given Schwann cell, to the next node of Ron VA to induce a new action potential. So the action potentials leap from node to node, and they call it the saltatory, it means dance, but it's like the, the action potentials dance down the neuron. <clears throat> So it increases the conduction velocity many fold. So if it wasn't for myelination, we'd have a much, much slower communication system. So it's a way of tremendously speeding up conduction. So if you look at myelinated ver nerve conduction versus non-myelinated nerve conduction, the velocity is much, much, much higher in myelinated than non-myelinated. Another aside here on this little figure, is the effect of, of, of uh, diameter just by itself. And as you can see, the larger the diameter of nerves, the more rapid they conduct, which is really just a uh, function of, of the passive characteristics of, of conductors. But anyway, the, the larger diameter neurons are always much faster in conduction than smaller, but myelination tremendously increases the velocity many fold. Uh, I also put a little aside there, and, and we're going to get into this a lot more later, but the signal that the nervous system conducts throughout our whole system is the same signal. It's an action potential that we've just spent the last 45 minutes discussing. So the only piece of information we can send from one cell to another is the same signal. So how does our brain know whether, whether we're experiencing pain or whether the person beside us is stroking our arm or whether somebody's pulling our hair. It's a couple different ways. And we're going to talk about this more when we get to the sensory system. But one way we can signal is how many of these uh, action potentials occur per unit of time. So that can be an amplitude signal. Uh, another way is by what route they come. We call it track. So different nerves conduct different information, obviously. If the retina, the nerves from the eye, the optic nerve conducts different information on the auditory, so one way we understand information and what type it is is by the track, uh, but none of it is by how high or how uh, large uh, action potentials are. They all have the same amplitude approximately. So we code information by frequency and track primarily. We'll talk more about that. Okay, I have another kind of interesting eye clicker question to kind of end the story I tried to start in the last lecture. So uh, this is another one that I'll see if uh, you guys can figure out. I talked about last time potassium, and I never answered the question on purpose, and let me read you the stem here. It says, electrolyte disorders are a prevalent cause of emergency room visits, and potassium is often the culprit. Hyperkalemia, which is higher than normal plasma, potassium, that usually means above 5 MEQs per liter, is often the cause of the problem. So the first way to look at this as a student is what would you expect to happen in people that have high potassium? Would their resting memory potential be hyperpolarized, depolarized, there's no effect? Very common.
critical question, and I tried to teach this to medical students for years and had trouble. So this is going to be something that will plague you unless you figure it out at the beginning. So what is what is hyperpolarization due to the membrane potential? So let me uh, let you answer that. Elevated exercise. and uh, about 50 to uh, percent, or 37 versus 80, I guess, and out of 60. Anyway, you can see about 40, 60 with uh, depolarization and hyperpolarization. This is a very critical question, but not easy to figure out. Not obvious. Now, why would one choose hyperpolarization? Uh, this is why we get confused, and sometimes it's helpful to understand the reasons why, for the confusion before we figure out what's the right answer. Uh, you can argue that the membrane, is become, the membrane is becoming hyperpolarized because you're adding more positive charges on the extracellular side. So remember, at rest, the membrane is more negative than positive. Negative on the inside, positive on the outside. So we're putting more positive on the outside, so that sounds like a more polar membrane. You're putting more potassium out here, so hence you're going to end up with uh, a higher potential difference. Or you might also think about this equation that I keep coming back to, and what you're doing is you're elevating the extracellular potassium concentration, and hence the membrane potential may be going up. So that would also lead to hyperpolarization. And so, unfortunately, both those answers are wrong. So it doesn't make sense, and it's not, it's not, you know, a simple story. So anyway, it turns out that uh, hyperkalemia leads to depolarization. And why is that? And you can experimentally prove it. If you take a, a neuron or any nervous cell or even muscle cell and increase the exercise potassium, you'll see the membrane will go from minus 90, 70, 60, it'll get depolarized. So elevating potassium on the outside of the membrane definitely causes depolarization. And the reason is because, again, the resting potential is a diffusion potential and it's created by potassium diffusing out of the cell. And so if you raise extracellular potassium out here, there's not as much need for potassium to leak out, and so not as much potassium will leak out, and therefore you won't create so much potential difference. It's just that simple. So essentially you decrease the gradient, and therefore you will have less efflux and less potential difference. So anyway, that's a classic, very important point, is hyperkalemia leads to depolarization. Now, what would that say about the patient that comes in with hyperkalemia? How would you recognize he's, he's uh, depolarized, his resting membranes are depolarized? Would his cells seem more excitable, less excitable? What do you expect? Well, I, was, I already had five eye like, clickers, and so I didn't decide to have another one. But if, if you depolarize the membranes of your cell, what happens to an excitable cell? Well, what happens is, a, as we said before, the amplitude, the action potential goes down. This is that... Uh, voltage inactivation story, it decreases DVM-DT, so those two things are decreased, but initially you're reaching, you're getting closer and closer to the uh, threshold voltage, and so initially you'll have spontaneous action potentials until you get up to the threshold, but then you'll be dead if you get that far. And so the first sign you see is twitches and increase in heart rate. 
A classic sign of a patient with hyperkalemia is tachycardia, his heart is just going like crazy. Another sign is what we call chobic signs, little twitches of the eye muscles and the muscles of the face start twitching. And that's again, the muscles are becoming uh, spontaneously contracting. And it's because your resting memory potential is depolarizing, you're reaching the threshold and those uh, sodium gates are opening. So anyway, it's a very clinically important concept and for some reason it's a hard one to learn initially. Okay, I want to then leave that and go into the exam. Let's talk about the exam next Thursday. Okay, so the material for the exam, don't forget we're also have the lecture on articulation, which was lecture seven, and then uh, the lectures eight through twelve that we've gone through the last couple of weeks. So this is uh, in the uh, anatomy book, chapter eight's on articulation, nine, ten, eleven are on muscles, and then in Boren and Volpe, five, six, and seven are on uh, uh, membranes and their characteristics. This one, the five, is just a little thing on Gibbs Donin. Six is on resting membrane and seven is on action potential. So those are the areas that are covered. Uh, there are the texts that are covered for the exam. Uh, the, oh, if I looked at the last five or six years, the average on the exam is about 66. Last year it was, you, this class so far is like last year's class. It's uh, done very well. And last year it was up to 68, 68, 70. So I imagine you'll be up in that range so that You'll probably be slightly uh, lower than you were on the last exam, is my guess, but it's going to be a lot more difficult exam, but students seem to figure me out and do a little better on the second exam, but it is a, a difficult exam. Okay, I will tell you this, uh, so I go up the questions on different areas of articulation. Uh, learn the different names for the different joints. I hate memorization questions, but you guys always do well on them, so what a syndesmosis is and all those different fancy names for joints uh, and the types of joints and the type of uh, hinge, what a hinge joint means, what a gliding joint, things like that. Uh, nothing other than the examples I gave in class will I point to, but learn the major parts of the uh, joints that I gave you right out of that lecture. Uh, molecular mechanism of contraction. There's 14 questions, but that was a long lecture. It was all about the um, architecture of the muscle and how it worked and then mechanics. So I have about equal number of questions on the different parts of the skeletal muscle and, and how uh, it's organized and, and works like the